Ron Nickel, you are the uh, president and CEO of Pri Prison Fellowship International, and you've been so for 30 years plus? 30 years. 30 years. Your first exposure to this side of the tracks was back with Youth for Christ, right? With it, uh, Young Life? Or no, with... Uh, um, it was Youth for Christ, Youth Guidance. Youth Guidance, Youth Guidance, yeah. right. Uh, did you have any idea then that the Lord was shaping you for this? No, absolutely not. I, I got into Youth Guidance because I wanted to do something different for a while, and uh, I thought it would be a good thing to do for a couple of years, and uh, I absolutely got hooked. Now, with Youth Guidance, you were dealing with uh, kids who were facing struggles and difficulties. Street kids, Street kids. juvenile offenders, drug addicts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how did the PFI thing come your way? Well, I was working here in Toronto with uh, juvenile offenders, and uh, then I took on national responsibility after a couple of years. Right. And uh, then I was invited to the U.S. to, to head up the national program there, for, also for Youth for Christ. And it was about that time, maybe a couple of years later, that I uh, began doing training in, um, internationally for uh, Youth for Christ. Uh, Singapore, Peru, Chile, countries that were interested in branching beyond the school ministry into the juvenile offender, the marginalized uh, uh, segment of the youth population. And uh, then around that time, I also met Chuck Colson. He had uh, recently been released from prison. Uh, Jay Kessler, who was the president of Youth for Christ U.S., uh, uh, was hosting a convention, and he invited me to come up to his suite to meet Chuck. And I was very cynical about Chuck. I mean, I thought this was a jailhouse conversion yeah. kind of thing. I didn't know much about it, but I was cynical about the possibility of a guy like that using his spiritual conversion to get a lighter sentence. And as we know, he only served seven months out of a three-and-a-half-year sentence. So I thought, nah, it worked. Didn't expect it to stick. And when I ta started talking with him and uh, hearing the passion of his heart, uh, I realized there was something else going on. And uh, when he invited me to consider working with him, um, it was irresistible. Are, are you cynical by nature? Yeah. Does that serve you well in the work you're doing? Sometimes it does because... Uh, you hear a lot of lines, don't you? Well, a lot of the inmates are actually Academy Award winners. You yeah. know, they really got it down. They can play it. They can play it. And uh, I, I'm kind of Reagan-esque. I say, trust but verify. Yeah. So prove it to me. This has been a huge adventure for you. This Abs last, this it's a continuing thing. adventure. Yeah, continuing Absolutely. adventure. Um, you've been in uh, over 100 countries in the world. You're working in over 100 countries in the world. Uh, you've been in every kind of abysmal uh, prison scene possible. Yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit about some of what you've seen. Well, you see the best of prisons and you see the hell holes of the world where people are, uh, the depravity, the dehumanizing conditions, the overcrowding, the stench of death um, is present. And you can't imagine how a human being can survive. You wouldn't treat animals that way. Um, and then I've been in these gleaming, five, what they call the uh, four-star hotels mm. of the uh, prison industry. And uh, yet there's a common denominator. Confinement is confinement is confinement. And prisons are the most illogical of human institutions. You can't expect to make a bad person good by locking them up with other people who have similar inclinations. Now, the, the, the general view that we have here in North America of a prison is something we've seen in the movies, uh, you know, or in a Western. Uh, we haven't gone into a dank, below-the-ground, dungeon-like hole with 40 or 50 guys sleeping on three- and four-layer layer, uh, bunks yeah. with no air, with no latrine, uh, or maybe one to serve 50 guys. And they're there for life, sometimes three and four life sentences, no hope of ever getting out. And this is their life with maybe an hour out a day to do some exercise. When you're sitting down with some of these guys, what is their worldview? What do they see? How can they have hope? I mean, you know, you're, you're there to, to be a presence, but also to lead them to the Lord. How, how can they ever have a positive thought? Very difficult. There are daydreams, there are dreams, there are, uh, they, they hang on to the impossible hope uh, of uh, the 
maybe somebody caring, somebody coming for them, somebody offering a pardon. And uh, I've been in countries where it is the only shred of hope. I was in, in Zimbabwe uh, mm. a couple of years ago, and um, a rumor was spreading throughout the prisons. It was just before Christmas that the president was going to grant amnesty to 900 prisoners. Every prisoner in Zimbabwe knew that they would be the one. Yeah, everybody's going to win the lottery. Everybody's going to win the lottery. Yeah, and that's yeah. the kind of thing that they hold on to. Or that maybe tomorrow's the day that my family member's going to come and see me, and that never happens. What about, what about the guy, or the gal for that matter, who's in there, and they haven't faced any charges yet? And they've been there eight, there eight nine, ten years, and no legal process yet has uh, occurred, but they're, they're in prison for reasons they don't know. Very common, uh, for reasons that they don't know or the system of justice has just ground on so slowly that in the process uh, their uh, dossier has been lost. Nobody can find the file. I was in the um, office of the Minister of Justice in um, well, one of the, I, th I think it was Central Africa Republic. Minister of Justice had all of the files for the whole country, every prisoner. And they were paper files stacked up on the floor. And I can't I can't imagine how you find somebody's file. And it's no wonder that the system moves slowly, but there are many, pro many, many reasons for this. You know, it's the lack of computerization and so forth. And the damage that is done in the meantime by a system that moves too slowly. Somebody said that justice delayed is justice denied. Yeah. It's absolutely true. These guys, are, these guys serve their sentence before they need to serve the sentence. Th these guys are truly lost. They are lost in the system. Lost, lost in the system. And and, you know, I think of the scripture, you know, that says Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Uh, what gives you any hope when you're doing this and the people who work with you going into these prisons? I mean, why do you do this when, in most cases, these guys will never really see the light of day again? Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. I, I, um, again, it's an African story. Yeah. I visited upper prison in, um, outside of Kampala, Zimbabwe, uh, Kampala, Uganda. Right. And... Uh, it was early on in my uh, time with prison fellowship. Uh, talked to the director of the prisons and he said, uh, I'd like to take you to death row, to the condemned section of this prison. And uh, I was a little apprehensive and I think he must have seen the look on my face. I didn't think I was telegraphing anything, but I must have. And he said, oh, don't worry, don't worry. You will find more joy in the condemned section of this prison than you'll find anywhere in Uganda. And it's like an impossible possibility. But it's true. When we went into that condemned section, it was one of the most joyful places that I've ever been in. Overcrowded, smelly, men in rags. Uh, but the sound of their voices praising God was absolutely heavenly. So, so this, this was a body of believers? Yeah. yeah. How had they come to the Lord? There was one inmate, uh, a fellow by the name of Chris, who was a political prisoner. Guy who had been responsible under uh, uh, Museveni. Museveni? Yeah. Uh, or um, Amin preceded him. Yeah, I mean, maybe it was under Amin. Yeah, one yeah. of the, not the current yeah. president, but yeah. the uh, prior president. Right. Obote. Obote. Right. Okay. And it was, had been responsible for the hit squads, yeah. death squads. Uh, had been arrested after Obote fell from power and uh, who was going to be spending the rest of his life in prison. I visited him early on in his time there. He was sick, he was depressed, he was discouraged, he was hopeless, he was angry, and all I did was say, can I, can I pray for you? Yeah, if you, if you want to. So I prayed for him. It was when I came back two years later and was invited to go to the condemned section, Chris was the leader of the Christian community in the condemned section. Guy had come to know Jesus. How, now, how had that happen? I have no I idea mean, you how prayed that for happened. Him, but I prayed for him. I continued correspondence with him. I think it was partly because he knew someone on the outside cared. So did he get a Bible? Or? He had access to a Bible through the chaplain. So these guys are in the condemned section of a Ugandan prison, and they're full of joy. Now, we have prisoners watching this program right now. For people in prisons watching and listening to you right now. Uh, and they may be anything but joyful. Yeah. How, how do you explain this? Maybe, maybe a guy's watching you right now who's in for five years, and he can just hardly wait to get out, you know, and he's going to pay everybody back. These, these guys are in there, they're going to die. They're going to die in there. 
and they're full of joy. Why? Something's happened to them. They know that somebody cares. But, 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 surely this has to be... Uh, I can't explain uh, it. There has to be something supernatural in this. I mean, it is supernatural. So what's happened to them? They have been touched by love in a way that you can't even explain. And they would, they would describe it as the love of, of God. Or what? They would explain it as, as grace. All of a sudden, everything grace. connects. They would say forgiveness because all of a sudden the load's been lifted. Mm. You know, guys in prison, whether they admit it or not, do feel a lot of guilt because everything in society says you're, you're bad, you're wrong, you're evil, you're no good. You know, get out of here. You're out of our, get out of our hair. Get out of our communities. And um, they, there's a pretty bad self-image. You just carry this weight of nobody cares, nobody, nobody will give me a break. And somebody comes along and it's usually a volunteer or someone who comes in the name of Jesus and says, but I do care. Jesus cares. And, and somehow in the human caring, in the midst of a person's anguish and uh, feeling of helplessness and hopelessness, there's a connection. And it is a spiritual connection. And it's not just telling someone that God cares and God loves and God forgives, but it's me or you coming into their situation and actually caring and actually forgiving and actually embracing them, no matter what. Makes a world of difference.